mounting medical negligence claims against the Department of Health in Limpopo have been blamed for destabilizing the provincial provision of health in the province. There's also a lack of consequent, consequence management, irregular expenditure and shocking vacancy rates adding to the problem. This in contrast with the health MEC Poppy Ramatuba's recent exchange with a Zimbabwean patient where she blamed foreign patients for putting pressure on the system. Let's speak more on this. We're joined by Professor Alex van der Heerwe, Chair of Social Security Systems Administration and Management Studies at the University of the Vidvata Rand School of Governance. Thank you, Prof, for availing yourself this afternoon. Maybe before we get into the conversation, your initial thoughts when you saw and heard the exchange. I think it was an incredibly unfortunate exchange and completely improper. The, uh, a patient within a facility is an extremely vulnerable person, and uh, a, an MEC and a senior representative of government is in a position of power and influence. And anything that they say in a health facility is also going to influence the other staff who are looking after that patient. So you've got an incredibly vulnerable individual surrounded by people now influenced by a berating by a minister, uh, a, a member of the executive council uh, in, a, in what is in raising an issue that has nothing to do with that particular patient. They have no control over the policy framework um, that results in, for instance, uh, the foreign uncompensated usage of uh, of healthcare services in South Africa by foreign uh, uh, people from foreign countries. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at uh, annual report analysis by the Office of the Auditor General. Um, what is it that actually stands out for you, especially in relation of this exchange? Well, the the, the province on the whole, uh, so the. Uh, there, there is an issue about uh, um, its sort of performance reporting, which uh, it, it's, it's unclear about whether or not we know truly what's going on in terms of outcomes within the province. Uh, for instance, maternal mortality ratios are reported to be very high in the province. The report also indicates rising um, medical legal claims, largely resulting from cerebral palsy cases. And those cerebral palsy cases tend to occur in uh, with you know when mothers are delivering their children and very often uh, the cerebral palsy case that result in court cases are because there's been negligence in the delivery of the child and uh, and a child that shouldn't have cerebral palsy now does have and uh, that that results in very very large uh, legal cl claims against against the province so we see a very big rise in those cases although the numbers um, amounts that are being paid every year are relatively small at this point, at least in terms of what's reported. But the amounts that are reflected in contingent liabilities are very high. Hmm. And that's just it, right? So this is quite curious that in 2016, a year after um, Ramatuba's uh, tenure, staff vacancy rates have been increasing. So you also find that these positions are not occupied, but those that are occupied, people are actually even being overpaid. Yeah, so it's it's uh, uh, so they've got quite an unusual profile in terms of appointments, in that the uh, the organisational structures are resulting in staff establishments that are only half full. Um, so normally, what you would be doing is you restructure your organise your uh, staff establishments. Uh, to come within reason of your financial capability to to um, fill those posts, and but to have half your posts unfilled is is very odd. It means that you're not really carefully restructuring your organisational establishments to fit the needs of the province. Um, but it also means there's quite a lot of scope for error in the financing of the um, of facilities because the possibility of appointing up to the full staff establishment, which might take the province over its budget quite considerably, uh, the, the scope for that sort of mismanagement, which occurs in a lot of provinces. Prof, how far back can we date the conversations or the issue of uh, migrants using South Africa's public health uh, services and cross-border compensation? Well, I, 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 I was part of these discussions in, uh, in 1994. So you'd have had two kinds of um, movements of people that can affect the financing of health establishments. The first is, uh, is interprovincial cross-boundary cross movements of patients, where somebody from Mpopo goes to, um, to Gauteng. 
And there you have to make sure that your financing system matches those patient flows. And there's a lot of movement. Now, and then the second one is cross-border cross flows, where you're dealing with international movements of people. This is common everywhere. People move around one way or another. Borders are also porous in South Africa, and you have to take into account that people will come to the South African facilities because of the, uh, the dire state of their own in their countries, potentially. So the, the issue is you have to d resolve that problem in the way you would internally by establishing a regional framework for financing those cross-border flows and coming to the intergovernment agreements on it. So South Africa forms part of SADC, we form part of regional agreements. And if you started in 1994, you would have had an agreement framework in place in which we would be able to cross, we would basically be able to build those provinces and offset those expenses. And that would include South Africans being treated in those countries as well. Okay. Now. If you look at this situation, this MEC made these comments in relation to that patient and yet has no real data, no information on the costs of those, those flows. They don't even have proper costs on the, on the movement of patients between provinces, let alone um, between countries. And yet this issue is raised. There's no policy document, no analysis, no, no, no evidence that there's even a policy process to deal with this at a governmental level. So this is really where I find a real, have a real problem, is it's absolutely preposterous when you haven't done your work to then shout at a patient. This lack of um, a policy or a position, especially for uh, cross-border compensation, um, you dated as far back as 1994 that talks were being held, you were part of the process. What then seems to be the cog in the system? Uh, why are we not getting it right? Is it a lack of, of, of will or foresight? It, it appears to be a lack of both. Um, I, it, what's happened, I, I, in my assessment of what's happened certainly in the last nearly two decades, is that government has basically lost interest in serious policy. It's, it's actually very difficult to resolve many major issues. They're quite complex in, mm. in health systems. But government appears to have just lost um, any kind of incentive to drive a major, real, on-the-ground strategic reform that makes a difference. There's nothing there. And, there's, and, and, and it comes down to, I would argue, that government has basically become distracted by other issues that have nothing to do with delivering health services to the population. Basically, people stopped talking policy around about sort of 15 to 20 years ago. And this is a, this is a real problem. We, 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 the, you don't get these kinds of problems addressed unless you begin a process of coherent deliberation, do proper analysis, and engage with society and with various stakeholders to solve these problems. They don't just solve themselves, and they don't get solved by attacking patients. Is South Africa the exception to the rule, though, when we speak of a lack of uh, policy or a position uh, on this. For instance, in Ghana, I think they have the national health insurance, and I do wonder whether that benefits you know, people who are not necessarily from that country as well. So do we find ourselves being the odd ones out, or is this an issue that we, we, we're grappling with, um, not only in the region, but maybe on the continent? I think that we would be more at risk uh, for, for these cross uncompensated cross-border movements because we do have the biggest health system in, in, uh, in Africa. And, uh, and so people come for both private and public services, and it's expected. So any country that has a reasonable health service is going to attract patients from those that don't have reasonable ones. In Ghana, their, their health services are considerably smaller than South Africa's. So they're not necessarily facing cross-border movements. And despite the framework that got in place in Ghana, a lot of people still have to pay out of pocket for private health services, although they're quite meager. So, but South Africa faces what's often referred to as an anti-selection risk. People come here uh, to use services. It's predictable, and you must manage it. It won't go away. It's, it's going to be here forever. Yeah. And regionally, countries haven't been resolving it. You almost expect it. South Africa is in a far stronger position to create and lead a coherent frame, develop, you know, policy framework along these lines because it is the most at risk. 
and uh, but it hasn't done so. So yeah, other countries aren't necessarily doing it here, but if you go to Europe, this is what's done. You create um, treaties and structures that allow for the uh, agreements on how to deal with the compensation for the movement of people across Europe and between countries even affiliated or related to Europe who are not part of the European Union. You obviously just don't leave this to ad hocery. Yeah, then, you know, a question then pops up or a thought pops up that we speak so much about the African Continental Free Trade Area Act and you wonder how much um, it will then, you know, be a reality if we're still stuck on issues that seem to have clear answers. Yeah, I mean, so it, it, one thing is that the movement of people in a region is something you can uh, you need to manage. It's not going to go away. It's like trying to stop the ocean, you know, King Canute. We think we can just keep ferrying people in and out of the country based on sort of legal frameworks about uh, legal access to the country. You very often regions have to accommodate movement reasonably and manage it as opposed to just block it, control and exclude. So we, but it's difficult and complex. And, uh, and unfortunately, what tends to happen, I think, in the South African policy discussions is we default to the, uh, to the silliest, weakest and most least thought through policy, because basically that's the only thing to do. It's the easiest thing to do because you've not really invested in anything more complex. Hmm. Professor Alex van der Heerve with the Wits School of Governance. Thank you very much for availing yourself this afternoon.